logic black and white bits and bytes of information turning darkness to love hello welcome to bits and bytes this episode is about using the computer to help teach things, what's called computer-assisted instruction, or CAI for short. To understand what CAI is all about, we're going to go on an excursion into two related fields, programmed instruction and artificial intelligence. But first, Billy Van will try a very simple form of computer-assisted instruction, which is called drill and practice. Ah. Texas Instruments Home Computer. I know this one. Two. Number magic. One for quick quiz, okay? Here we go. Simple. Correct. Elementary. Correct. Now I'll deliberately get this one wrong. Try again. Try again. I hit any number and it comes up right on the third try. This is pure drill and practice. It drills you and gives you practice in elementary math. But it's not giving you any new information. It's not really teaching you anything. So it assumes that I've already been taught how to do the calculations. It's just giving me a lot of exercises to work through. That's it exactly. Try another one that's been set up, this time on the pet computer. There's a program on this disc called What Goes that was especially written to illustrate various levels of drill and practice. Press return. Simple refusal. What goes woof woof? Well, obviously a dog. But let's see what happens if we say pig. No, try again. All right. What goes meow? Well, let's say pig again. Okay, that's cat. This first level drill merely tells you you're wrong if you make a mistake. Press the asterisk to go on to the next level. This level blocks the wrong key. Well, we know that's a mouse, so we'll try cat again. Uh-oh. Oh, you can hear you're wrong. How about a dog? Nope. Wrong key correction. What goes squeak? Well, that's a mouse, but let's misspell it. Wrong letter, but the computer makes it right. On this one, if you hit the wrong key, it gives you the correct one. What goes oink? That would be a pig will say a cat. Oh, for goodness sake, it gives you the right answer. This level gives you a little more help. It gradually completes the word for you. All right, let's try a horse. No, it starts with C. Let's say, a cod. It starts with C-A. It gives you more hints each time. So it's obviously cat. That's right. And this gives you still more information. Let's try a dog. Oh. Nope, a dog goes woof woof. It actually understands, or seems to. What goes moo? Cow? Terrific. In fact, this last level of drill and practice is bordering on a second form of CAI, the tutorial, where the computer simulates the behavior of a private tutor. Well, how does that work? Well, tutorial CAI is really programmed instruction on the computer. Let's look at how this has evolved. Here's a very simplified model of a tutorial with one teacher and one student. The teacher takes a chunk of subject matter, whether it be math or history or physics or whatever, breaks it up into small, easily digestible items of information, arranges these items in a logical sequence, and then feeds the first one into the mind of his pupil. Before proceeding to item number two, he asks the student a searching question to test whether or not he has grasped item number one. 
If he answers correctly, the teacher feeds him the second item, asks another searching question, and so on. But if the student answers incorrectly, the teacher feeds him the first item again, perhaps presenting it from another angle this time, or breaking it down into even tinier units. And he will go on doing this until he is quite certain that his pupil has understood item number one, and it is safe to proceed to the next unit of information. This is all very fine, but of course, in a mass education system, we can't afford the luxury of one teacher per student. The nearest we can get to this is to have one textbook per student. And back in the 1950s, this gave the educational psychologists an idea. They decided to take a textbook and break it up into small, easily digestible items of information, arrange these items in a logical sequence, present the first item to the student, and then ask him a multi-choice question to test his understanding before presenting him with the next item or branching him to some appropriate remedial sequence. Programmed instruction was born, a first attempt at an automated tutorial. But the programmed textbook was awkward to use and involved a lot of page turning. So in the 1960s, the teaching machine was invented to turn the pages mechanically, so to speak. But these machines were pretty cumbersome. So in the 1970s, when the computer became cheap enough to be used in schools, it took over the role of the teaching machine and turned the pages electronically, in a sense. And that is how programmed instruction graduated from the program text to the teaching machine to the computer. So programmed instruction on the computer is called Tutorial CAI. That's right. Well, do we have an example of this type of CAI on any of these computers? A few years ago, there was a lot of Tutorial CAI around, but nowadays it's very difficult to find a pure tutorial on a microcomputer. Most of the educational software is a mixture of various techniques, and the nearest we could get was a short demonstration of a tutorial on the Apple computer. Hi, Billy. Do you know what a legend is? Well, I think it's a story. Well, that's very true, Billy, but the word legend has another important meaning. A legend also explains how to read a map or chart. That's what we'll look at in this lesson. Maybe we can share some tall tales some other time. Okay, we sure can. Just as a key unlocks a door, a legend is used to explain or unlock a map. Really? Looking at the legend in the upper right-hand corner, Billy, what would you say the blue circles on the map represent? I'm going to see if I can fool the computer. Okay, I'm going to say it's a hole in the ground. No, a blue circle stands for water, such as a lake or a sea. Notice the blue circles in the legend. What symbol stands for laugh birds? Okay, I'm going to try the opposite. I want to use the greater than sign. Almost right. Uh, what symbol looks like that but points the other way? The less than sign, of course. You know, that's like having a bit of real dialogue with a teacher. But isn't that the same sort of technique I used on an earlier episode for the history quiz? Yes, the programmer has to anticipate the answers that the student will give. It's a sort of hidden multi-choice method. The multi-choice anticipated answers are in the program, but you don't see them. So if answer equals water, print, that's right. If not, print, no, try again. That sort of thing? That's how it would go in basic. But the Legends tutorial was written in a language called Pilot, Programmed Inquiry, Learning, or Teaching. How does Pilot work? I'll show you a very simple example. T stands for type, A stands for answer, and M stands for match. If the student gives an answer that matches Everest, type, that's right. T-Y stands for type if yes. If the student's answer does not match Everest, type no, try again. T-N stands for type if no. You can learn pilot in a couple of hours, but it's still very specialized. It virtually forces you to write standard tutorials or drill in practice. 
Now look at another disc. Elementary, my dear Apple. Oh, yes, here we are. Choose the Supermath example. Supermath, that's number three. Hi, welcome to Supermath. Thank you. What's your first name? My name is Billy. I think I'll try multiplication. That's three. You want to multiply by the same number each time? Yes. What number do you wish to practice? All right, uh, zero times three is zero. Terrific, true. Next. Okay, one times three is three. This is just a drill, isn't it? Yes, the part you've been doing so far is a drill. The more questions you get right, the harder they become. But if you keep making mistakes, it will eventually give you some remedial instruction. I'm going to purposely give some wrong answers to see how the computer handles it. Two times three is seven. Eight. Two times three is four. Oh, I see. Now it's switching from drill and practice to a tutorial, and it's keeping score for me. You know, this is a lot more than just electronic page turning, isn't it? That's right. One other example now. Look at the program on the Atari. Oh boy, I hope it's a game. My first alphabet. Try letters and numbers. Press select, then start. With this, the child gets a little reward if he hits the key that matches the letter or number on the screen. Okay, letters and numbers, all right. Letters and numbers. E. What picture will we get? Is it an elephant? Oh, I love the games where I get them right. E. Eagle, Eskimo, ear, and elephant. A musical reward, that's terrific. Terrific graphics. Yes, this one makes really good use of pictures, sounds, and animation. But is it a drill? Is it a tutorial? How would you classify it? I couldn't really tell you except to say it's a lot of fun. We've come a long way from old-fashioned programmed instruction. The computer is being used more and more to add special elements to CAI that you couldn't produce in any other way. Isn't it marvelous? Aren't students lucky today? Well, we've been looking at some of the best examples that's available. But the fact is the overwhelming majority of CAI programs for microcomputers really consists of rather mundane variations on the drill and practice theme. Most of the high quality CAI is still in large computers that you hook into via terminal. One excellent example is what they're doing at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education using a system called CAN8. This is an example from the grade 7 through 10 mathematics course, topic 1 on identifying shapes. They may now take a test or instruction. Suppose we select instruction. First figures will be triangles with metric measurements shown on the sides. The scalene triangle being in blue, the magenta triangle being isosceles, and the cyan triangle being equilateral. Quadrilaterals have different names. Trapezoids, parallelograms, rhombus, rectangle, and the simple square. Now the student's allowed to take practice problems before they actually begin the assessment phase to see if they have understood all the instruction that they've had previously. If the student says yes, they get up to five problems to practice. I'll select one. The computer creates then a multiple choice question for us. Which of the following figures is a rhombus? I'll select A, which is correct. Now that I've finished my practice problems, the actual test begins. We'll select B, and it flashes to show me that C is the correct answer, B was not. This statistical procedure is used to save the student's time in test taking so that we can stop a test very quickly if the student is not demonstrating mastery and return to instruction. 
We employ a wide variety of instructional strategies from simple drill and practice, which does have some benefit, through tutorial instruction, through simulations, through the student actually programming the computer. The CAN-8 system is available on many computers and on several microcomputers. We utilize it on the mini computer version because the work that we do here is in the production and evaluation of materials. If we use the microcomputers for that, it would be very difficult to collect the data on the student performance in the courses so that we would know how to revise the courses. And it would also be very difficult to distribute new versions of the course. The materials that we develop are subject to a lot of evaluation. 42 teachers were surveyed. None of the teachers involved did not desire to continue using computer-assisted instruction. The student attitudes were very positive. 96% of the students wanted to continue using it. They found it fun, satisfying, and interesting. You can see achievement results, probability, measurement, statistics, and algebra, arithmetic, integers and rationals, coordinates and transformations, in each case very significant. There's a system at the Xerox Corporation in California called Interlisp that adds a whole new dimension to CAI. The Interlisp D environment is a very, very well-equipped, powerful workshop in which you can put together almost anything. What we did with this system was to build an intelligent coaching system which is built on top of a arithmetic drill and practice game called How the West Was Won, which would watch what the student was doing and come in and suggest some of the complexities at times that were appropriate by comparing their, their behavior with what an expert would do in exactly the same situation. The system that you see here has a uh, collection of windows on it and I control most of what the windows do by means of a device called a mouse because it's very easy for people to learn how to do and avoids the necessity of them knowing how to type. How the West Was Won is a linear board game. It says select here to continue, so I will hold down one of the mouse buttons over that. And when that happens, the computer generates three random numbers from its spinners. And the object of the game is that you take those three numbers and form an arithmetic expression using the operations plus, minus, times, and division. And that the result of that arithmetic expression dictates how far you move along the board. Now, in order to make the game more complicated than just making large numbers, there are certain special moves. If you land in a town at the end of your turn, then you automatically advance to the next town. In addition to towns, there are also shortcuts. And there's also a rule that if you land on the same square that your opponent is on, then that's a bump and he goes back two towns. And yet most of the students who actually play it don't see all of those possibilities. They tend to lock into a strategy which is always making the best possible move and they just continue to do that over and over again. Now behind the scenes the computer has been developing a model of our strengths and weaknesses and decided that now was an appropriate time to come in and say something based on a reasoning process which recognized that I have not in the past used division and it's going to come in and suggest a better move at this point. Would you like to see an example? And what it does is to give me an example of how I would have gotten a much better move. It then offers me a chance to take my turnover so that I can run through that and actually experience that happening. So we're striving for an environment in which the student has the freedom to do whatever they want, but the machine knows some things because we've programmed it in, and it's capable of using that knowledge to help the student discover some of the structure so that the student is not there alone. He actually has some guidance or tutoring. So that interlist program is almost like a real tutor, isn't it? But could the computer ever really simulate a human teacher in every way? I mean, if it could, then computers could replace teachers. It's extremely unlikely. But what if you had a perfectly natural dialogue with a computer? Wouldn't that be like talking to another human being? If you could have a perfectly natural dialogue, it's a very big if. A typical attempt to get a computer to simulate a real conversation is a program called ELIZA. There's a simplified version of it on the PET. Please tell me your problem. What's this all about? ELIZA simulates the sort of conversation that you might have with a psychiatrist. Pretend that you have some psychiatric problem. Type it in and see what happens. I'm depressed.
My daughter left home. Okay. Please go on. Well, I certainly don't want her to get into trouble. What would it mean to you if she gets into trouble? Well, wouldn't you worry? You're just a dumb machine anyway. And I'm going to tell you so in your own language. Do computers frighten you? You know, that's really incredible. It's as if it really understood what I was saying. But it doesn't, of course. It's just a bag of tricks. It has a lot of canned phrases such as, please tell me your problem, tell me more, please go on. It's programmed to throw these out from time to time. Yeah, but it seemed more than just random. If you start a sentence with, I am, it might turn it around with, how long have you been? But it doesn't really understand any of this conversation. Type in some nonsense and you'll see. All right. Tell me more about... Oh, I get it. It hasn't the faintest idea what I'm talking about. It can only do what the programmer has told it to do. He didn't anticipate your nonsense response, so the computer can only turn your sentence around and play it back to you like a parrot. But must the programmer always give the computer all the information in advance? No, not always. There's another technique for getting the computer to learn as you talk to it. There's an example of this on the Apple. People have been teaching me about animals. Help me learn more by playing a guessing game with me. Love to. Think of an animal. Okay, I've got one. It's your first question. Does it live on land? No. Is it bigger than you? No. Is it a guppy? <laughs> nope. Type the animal you were thinking of and return. It's a swan. I don't know the difference between a swan and a guppy. Let's build a sentence. How is a swan different from a guppy? One, a swan has wings. Thanks, I'll remember that. You help the computer ask better and better questions so that it can make better guesses about which animal you're thinking about. It also develops a longer and longer list of animals that it can identify. Yes, but it's still a trick, though, isn't it? In a way, but the computer is now adapting what it does based on what you're telling it. Of course, there's still no real understanding on the part of the computer. So computers can't think? They definitely cannot think. Well, will computers ever understand anything of any sort? That's the question that people who work in the field of artificial intelligence have been asking for the last 30 years or more. Is there such a thing as artificial intelligence? They still don't know. But what the artificial intelligence research does make clear is that the computer has certain fundamental limitations that we tend to overlook. Let's just take the example of trying to converse with the computer. In many ways, the computer is like a newborn baby. And trying to carry on a conversation with it involves the same sort of problems. First of all, it doesn't understand a word you're saying, simply because it doesn't know any words. You have to teach it all of its vocabulary syllable by syllable. The second conversational problem shared by both babies and computers is that even when they have learned to talk, they don't have much to talk about. Because for that, you need experience. And here's where babies and computers part company. As it grows up, a baby will acquire more and more mental experience. But not only that, it will also acquire more and more physical experience. It will learn how to hold things, how to walk, how to sit on chairs, and it will acquire emotional experience as well. How to be angry, how to be happy, how to be sad. And so as we grow older, we human beings share a richer and richer mental, physical, and emotional context in which to talk about things. Not so the poor computer. We may program a certain amount of our mental experience into it, but we can never give it any physical experience. It will never learn how to sit on a chair, for example, because it has nothing to sit on a chair with. It has no body. Nor will the computer ever acquire any emotional experience. It will never learn how to be angry, or happy, or sad, 
because it has no emotions or feelings or sentiments of any kind. So the only way that we could enable a computer to be as good at conversation as a real, live, adult human being would be to write a program which contained not only a whole lifetime of mental experience, but descriptions of a lifetime of physical and emotional experience as well. Such a program would probably go on forever. But until it is written, the computer has no guideposts to help it understand the world. It floats in a sort of limbo with no points of reference whatever. To give just one simple example, if it comes across a phrase such as this, even if all these words have been programmed into its memory, it still can't understand this phrase because like nearly all human language, it's ambiguous. It might signify one thing to a poet and quite another thing to a lover of insects. And of course, the computer has no experience of either poetry or insects. That's its trouble. It has no experience of anything. It's a newborn baby that never grows up. So there's probably not much danger of computers replacing teachers, is there? No, not really. But perhaps we shouldn't even be trying to get the computer to imitate human behavior. There are so many other things that the computer is so much better at keeping records, manipulating the time element, interactive animation, and so on. I suppose that's the attraction of video games, right? It sure is. Many educators argue that the game approach to learning is a more promising one to explore with the computer than the tutorial one. And this is the topic of our next episode, when we'll see how the exciting elements in computer games can be put to educational use. <laughs> so, instead of firing missiles, I'm firing light and learning the angle at which light is reflected. Isn't he terrific? We'll also analyze how computer simulations work and see how they can be applied in the classroom. Oh dear, I've just destroyed a $1 billion power plant. They made a gigantic mess. Oops, rats. Oh well, and press the start button. You start all over, no harm done. Until then, I'm Luba Goy for Bits and Bites. And I'm Billy Van. Bye for now. See you soon. I think I'll think of a yam.